today we're going to do things a little bit in a slightly different order than we than is uh, listed in the the calendar. Um, so today we're going to uh, start by talking about the, the the conventional or macroscopic analysis of circuits and related to relate it to what we know about what's going on microscopically in circuits. And then if we have time, we'll start, we'll talk a little bit about capacitors in circuits. So, um, so the strategy we're going to use for talking about circuits macroscopically um, is actually not real different from the strategy that we we use when we're talking about them microscopically. Namely, um, we do still involve the same fundamental principles. Uh, they just look slightly different in their implementation. So when we're talking about a circuit, remember that there were two, quote, rules that we use, the, the, the node rule, which says that the sum of current into some location in a circuit has to be equal to the, the sum of current going out from that location in the circuit in the steady state. And the loop rule, which just says that, that, that the potential difference for a round trip Um, had to, has to come out to zero. And, and, and we could, of course, write this node rule <clears throat> using conventional current instead of electron current. So we could just say that the current into a node is equal to the current out of a node. And um, However, when people, if you work with circuits in the real world, you you uh, you don't find people talking about the number of electrons per second passing a, a point, even though they might. So your fuses are rated in amperes. Your um, and people talk about power in watts. And so we'd like to make a a, a transition between what we've been doing and the conventional way of talking about circuits. So the first topic we're going to talk about is resistance. Now we've actually touched on this a little bit before because we've talked about the fact that in a in a circuit with um, with connecting with some sort of power supply like a battery here. Um, and maybe a light bulb in it, and then some wire is connecting the, the bulb to the battery. We've talked about the fact that, that the potential difference across the light bulb is, is very large because you need a big electric field in the light bulb, and the potential difference across the connecting wires is is so small that we can neglect it. It's not actually zero, but it's it's very small compared to the, uh, the potential difference across the light bulb. And so, so in this situation, we talk about this bulb here as a is a resistor, and the wires as things that basically don't really count as resistors. So what, what is a resistor? What is resistance? <clears throat> well, remember that we talked about electron current. Um, which is the number of electrons per second passing a, a location. And we talked about conventional current. which is just the number of coulombs per second passing 
a location. So this is coulombs per second. This is electrons per second. <clears throat> and that was just equal to the, the, the charge of an electron times the electron current. And so if we, but that depended on various things. So we had an equation for conventional current in which uh, conventional current was, we could calculate it by taking the charge of the mobile charge times the density of mobile charges times the cross-sectional area of the conductor times the average drift speed. But since the average drift speed was proportional to the electric field through the mobility, so we got I equals Q N A U E, where E is the magnitude of the electric field inside the conductor. Now there's some things in this equation that are actually um, properties of the material the, the conductor is made of. So, so properties of the material. And there's some other things that have to do with the geometry of the, the situation. So things that are properties of the material, well, if elect if if the whatever the mobile charges are in the material is a property of the material. Now, usually we've been talking about things where the mobile charges are electrons. There are substances where the mobile charges are actually something else. And we talked about salt water where we'd have sodium ions and chloride ions moving. <clears throat> it's also the case that in semiconductors, and we can talk about this a little bit later, the mobile charges are also not electrons, but they are, they're actually positive often, and they're called holes and you can kind of think of them as a place where an electron isn't and it's those things that kind of diffuse through the material but in most metals the the conductors are electrons so the properties of the elect of the charge of the mobile charge the the density of mobile charges more mobile charges per cubic meter makes something a better conductor and the mobility like how many meters per second the drift speed is depend you know per volt per, volt per meter per electric field so these so so q n and u are properties of the material and often this set of properties of the material gets lumped together into a quantity called the conductivity and this is lowercase greek sigma <clears throat> and so some materials have greater conductivity than other materials do so we can rewrite our our equation here is just Conventional current is the conductivity of the material <clears throat> times times a cross-sectional area times the electric field in the material. <clears throat> now, sometimes um, people actually factor out the the cross-sectional area by writing it this way. So if you write the, the, the number of coulombs per second per square meter is equal to the conductivity times the electric field, where this quantity, the it's called the current density. <clears throat> so it's amperes per meter squared. Um, <clears throat> And so you get it, it, this equation can sometimes be written as the current density is pro proportional to the applied electric field by it, and the proportionality factor is the conductivity. So let's just actually um, calculate uh, a conductivity. 
So let's let's remember our equation here. The the conductivity sigma is charge of the mobile charge times the mobile electron density times the mobility. <clears throat> Given that, what actually is the the conductivity of copper? Okay, so most of you said that the conductivity of copper is 5.76 times 10 to the seventh ampere meter squared per volt per meter, which is correct. Um, and since we know copper is a good conductor, um, this must be a fairly high conductivity. Now, how do we get this answer? Well, we used the equation. If you gave the answer two, you probably didn't exactly use this equation. So the conductivity is the charge of an electron, so 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times the mobile electron density, 8 times 10 to the 28th electrons per cubic meter times the mobility, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second per volt per meter or newton per coulomb, and we get 5.76, 5.7 times 10 to the seventh ampere meter squared per volt per meter. <clears throat> Um, okay, so it's, we've talked about nichrome as kind of wire that's not a very good conductor. It's made of a, a mixture of, certainly has nickel and chromium in it. And so one question is that we might want to ask, ask is how much higher is the conductivity of copper than the conductivity of nichrome? So we have here the uh, the mobile electron density and the mobility of mobile electrons in both copper and nichrome. Uh, and electrons are the mobile carriers in both of those. So the question is, how much better a conductor is copper than nichrome? All right, so here's what you said. You said that copper is 57 times a better conductor than nichrome because the conductivity of copper is 57 times that of nichrome. And that's correct. So presumably what you did is you said the, the conductivity of copper divided by the conductivity of nichrome is going to be the mobile electron density of copper times the electron mobility of copper divided by the mobile electron density of nichrome, which is actually higher, uh, times the mobility, which is significantly lower. And we got 57.1, so copper is 57 times better conductor than, than nichrome. So we can say that something of the same dimensions, the same cross-sectional area, you know, same length and whatnot, um, we can say, well, we know that copper is going to be that much better than nichrome. But one of the things we want to do is, is often want to do is characterize a particular object. So conductivity, so conductivity, I'll just write it here. Um, conductivity is a property of a material. But it doesn't it conductivity alone doesn't tell you what's going to happen with a piece of 
particular hunk of that material. So the concept of resistance combines the properties of material and geometry. So remember that we had um, an equation where we said the, the uh, conventional current, well, we can start from current density is conductivity times the electric field in an object, and that's conventional current per meters squared. So if we rearrange this slightly, we get the conventional current is equal to conductivity times the cross-sectional area times the electric field in that particular piece of conductor. But the electric field in that piece of conductor, there's some geometry hidden in here. So this is geometry. But this is, there's actually some geometry hidden in here too. Because remember that, um, so we can, exp remember that potential difference is minus E dot delta L. And so the absolute value of potential difference in a situation where the electric field is uniform is was was e times l <clears throat> um, and therefore we can actually rewrite this e in terms of the potential difference across this piece of a circuit and its length so we can rearrange this we can write this as conductivity is uh, conventional current is conductivity times cross-sectional area times the potential difference across this particular resistor divided by its length. And of course, length is a piece of its geometry. So now we have these two geometric factors here. Um, and if we want to rearrange we can rearrange this so let's just regroup this we can rewrite as conventional current is conductivity cross-sectional area divided by l times <clears throat> delta v and for historical reasons i mean this this looks like a, a perfectly good quantity that we could call something but for historical reasons it's actually um, one over this thing that actually is important. So um, we can write, rewrite this as um, the potential difference divided by the inverse of that quantity, which is the length divided by the conductivity times the cross-sectional area. And it is this thing here that is called the resistance of this object. So, and it's given a symbol R. So R is resistance of some particular thing like this particular light bulb or this particular piece of wire. And we can calculate it if we know the length, the conductivity, and the cross-sectional area of the, of the, the object. So it depends on, on two things. It depends on, on properties of the material, and it also depends on geometry. Resistance has a unit. Um, 
its units are are ohms and the symbol for ohm is an uppercase Greek omega. So we've defined two quantities here. We've defined conductivity and we've defined resistance. And these are things we'll find in handbooks and whatnot. <clears throat> now, we have this equation basically here. Let's, let's rewrite it. The current, so for a circuit element, like a light bulb or a piece of wire or uh, some other kind of a resistor, the current through that circuit element is equal to the potential difference across that circuit element divided by the resistance. <clears throat> or we can rewrite this as current times resistance is equal to delta V. But it's actually true only for some materials. And for any particular material, and we'll, we'll see in a minute why that is, but for any particular material, it's not even absolutely true because it turns out that um, as a material gets hot, the electron mobility changes and therefore the conductivity changes and therefore the resistance changes. So if there's a big temperature change, the resistance of something can change. So let's see if we can actually do um, an analysis of a simple circuit in these terms, okay? So here's a, here's a familiar circuit. We take a light bulb and connect it to two batteries. Um, and let's see if we can answer a question about it. So, So here's this light bulb. This is one with a particularly thin filament. It's connected to two 1.5 volt batteries. And with connecting wires, the current is uh, 0.075 amperes. What is the resistance of this glowing hot light bulb? Resistance and resistivity are not the same thing. Um, resistivity is, is resistance per something, and I think it might be length. So the majority said the answer was number four, 40 ohms, and that's right. <clears throat> So how do we do that? Well, we actually did it exactly the same way we analyze circuits microscopically. So we, we wrote a loop equation. So delta V round trip is zero. And so this is the positive end of the batteries. So we went this way around the circuit. And so we had the potential, so we had the, the potential difference of the batteries plus the potential difference of the wires plus potential difference over the light bulb had to be zero in our round trip. And we, we this is negligible compared to the resistance of the light bulb. So now we have, um, the potential difference across the batteries, that's just the EMF of the batteries. And the potential difference across the light bulb, well, looks like delta V 
is going to be equal to IR. And we know that this is going to be a negative number because since we went against the electric field in, in the batteries here, we're actually going to be going with the electric field inside the light bulb. And so that's going to be negative. So we have EMF plus a minus current in the bulb times the resistance in the bulb equals zero. And so the resistance is just going to be three volts divided by 0 0.075 amperes, which is 40 ohms. So when, when is this relationship, this potential difference across the circuit element equal to current times resistance? When, when is that true? Well, there are materials that we call ohmic for which it's true. And so if we, so an ohmic material, <clears throat> if we plot current versus potential difference, so if delta V is current times resistance, then current should be directly proportional to, to the potential difference applied. And so you get this constant slope. Now, is, this, is the slope of this curve r or 1 over r here? Yeah, it's 1 over r, isn't it? So, and, and it's a constant. So the slope is not changing. So that resistance is a constant here. If we do this, though, for a, a semiconductor, we get a really, really, really different curve. So if we start applying a potential, so we have a particular resistor made out of a semiconductor, we start applying a potential difference. And what we actually get for quite a while is absolutely nothing. So we get zero current until we get up to some particular potential difference. And then in fact, the current goes up really fast. Semiconductors like silicon, germanium, um, actually are really interesting. And they're, of course, really key in technology because computer chips are made out of semiconductors, usually silicon. Um, and so a semiconductor has initially no mobile charges at all. Um, but when the electric field gets high enough, then, then some, some mobile charges are actually generated. Um, so if some will, so some, what actually happens is some electrons go into a, a higher energy state. Um, and then the thing becomes a conductor. So it's this property of being a conductor under some circumstances, but under other circumstances, not being a conductor that makes semiconductors really valuable for, for computer processors because there are two states. If it's not a conductor, that corresponds to a zero. And if it's a conductor, that corresponds to a one. And now you can encode everything in binary and you've got, you've got a computer. So now, even for something that really is more or less ohmic, we have to be careful because if the temperature changes a lot, um, then the resistance is not a constant. Um, Quantum computers are completely different. Um, they're they're uh, they're not necessarily even using semiconductors or metals. And I know almost nothing about quantum computing, but it's, it's it actually 
you can do it with lots of things and it has to do with actually looking at the quantum mechanical states of different parts of molecules or, or um, So let's just take an example of, of a, a material that's omic. So a light bulb filament is made, made of tungsten. And so if we, we consider um, a light bulb like, like one of our little flashlight bulbs here. Um, so if we use, um, one battery, so we're gonna just, we just hook it up to, to, um, different power supplies. Um, so if we hook it up to a one, one and a half volt battery, we get a current of 80 milliamperes. So that's, what is that in amperes? That would be point zero eight amperes if we hook it up to a three and a half volt battery the current is a hundred milliamps or 0.1 ampere and if we use a a 50 millivolt power supply which is actually something that those multimeters produce to make resistance measurements we get a six milliamp uh, current, actually. Yeah, I haven't taken the time to do much reading about quantum computing either. It's, it's obviously a very intriguing field and, and looks like it has great promise for the future, but I, I cannot explain to you how they work. So let's actually see if we can if we can calculate, if we can decide if something's omic or, or not. So here is a question related to that from a different kind of bulb. And the question is, is this an omic device or not? I think about how you'd figure out if this is omic or not omic. Okay, that does not look like a consensus at all. So it either is or it isn't. Um, so how would we how would we tell? Well, we said for an ohmic material the resistance was constant. So 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 the ratio of I to delta V was the same, right? <clears throat> So let's just calculate the resistance in these two cases. So, um, so in the first case, we have um, so we have EMF plus a minus IR equals zero. So um, EMF divided by the current is going to give us the resistance, right? <clears throat> and if we do this calculation, so, and this is one and a half volts, and this is three volts. So in this case, if we do this calculation, we get the resistance is, um, sorry, I've got that backwards. <laughs> three volts, 1.5 volts. So we've got a 40 ohm resistance with two batteries and we have only a, a 30 ohm resistance with one battery. So the resistance is in fact not constant as we change the potential difference and therefore the bulb is not an ohmic resistor. Even though tungsten is a metal, it just got, it gets really, really hot. The, it's a lot. It's a lot brighter with two batteries, and so. All right. Now there are some symbols for circuit 
so conventional symbols for circuit elements. So drawing batteries and light bulbs is actually time consuming. And so there are some schematic symbols that we use to make these, to make it, make it easier to draw these diagrams. So instead of drawing a battery and then putting, let's say a capacitor into the circuit and then adding a light bulb into the circuit, we'd like to be able to use some conventional symbols that just make it easier to draw these circuits. So the first thing um, is what's a battery, a con conventional symbol for a battery or a power supply. Well, the symbol is this. There's a, a short line and a longer line with connectors leading up to it. So that's a battery. And usually in diagrams, they're not labeled, but by convention, that's the positive end of the battery. And that's the, the negative end of the battery. And the resistor, in this case, a light bulb. And by saying it's a resistor, it could be a light bulb, it could be a piece of nichrome wire, it could be a thing that looks like this. Um, there's a little stripy thing here that's, that's a resistor that are sometimes used to make circuits. Um, and so a symbol for a resistor looks like this. So here's a connector and then it's just got jagged lines and that's a resistor. And the only thing that's that's probably really obvious is what a capacitor is going to look like. And that's just two lines of equal thickness representing the plates. So if we redrew this, this circuit we've drawn a picture of here with these symbols, we draw um, a battery here with the, the longer of the plus end on on that the left because that's the way it is and then we have a capacitor here and we're going to talk about capacitors and circuits and then up here we've got a resistor which is a light bulb and we idealize this by pretending that all of our wires make nice straight lines even though they don't when we hook up a real circuit. Um, so that makes it a lot easier to draw, quickly draw a circuit and talk about it. Okay, when we're analyzing circuits, um, we, uh, we use exactly the same technique. So we've got loop and node equations. And so let's imagine a circuit, for example, here, that has more than one resistor. So here's a circuit with a battery and a resistor R1 and another resistor R2 and another resistor R3. And let's say they're all different. <clears throat> so we could write a loop equation and let's say um, let's say we want to find out the current. So what's the current? And we know R1, R2, R3, and the EMF of the battery. Well, we could just write a loop equation. Um, so we have the EMF plus the potential difference across resistor one plus the potential difference across the resistor two plus delta V three equals zero. And so we're going 
that way around the circuit because we're going toward the positive plate of the battery here. And these, then we can rewrite these as, as uh, in terms of current and resistance. So we'd write EMF minus the current in resistor one times the resistance of resistor one minus the current of resistor two times the resistance of resistor two minus the current in resistor three times the resistance of resistor three is zero. Now that looks like we have one equation in three unknowns because we've got I1, I2, and I3 here. But a node equation helps us here. <clears throat> so if we establish a node, say, here in between the first and second resistors, we, the, um, and, and we're always talking about conventional current in these circuits. So the direction of conventional current is, is going to be going that way, um, away from the positive end of the battery. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we have this current one, the resistor one, we have current two through resistor two, but I1 has to equal I2 because we're in the steady state and we can't be piling up electrons anywhere. And likewise, if we make another node here, we see that I2 equals I3. So there's the current in all these resistors has to be the same. So now we can just rewrite this equation as EMF minus IR1 minus IR2 minus IR3. Now that we know there's only one current equals zero. And so the current in this circuit would then be the EMF divided by R1 plus R2 plus R3, right? And it, it kind of looks like um, here actually for these EMF minus the current times the sum of all the all the, the resistances. Um, so it kind of looks like the same as if there was, it's the same mathematically as if there was one resistor that had the, the total resistance of all of these. And this is, this is called a series circuit. Um, because um, the resistors come one after another in the circuit, starting in the battery. So this is, the situation in a series circuit. Now there are other ways we could we could wire up these resistors though. So we could um, we could make a really different circuit that looks like this, where we have resistor one resistor two, resistor three. This is, this is a parallel circuit because the resistors are in parallel to each other. You, you never, you know, current never flows through all three of them and it flows through only one. <clears throat> And so how do we analyze this circuit? Well, we have a, a node. So we're, we've got, we really do have different currents here. So this is an I3, this is an I2, and that's an I1. But if we put a node here, say, we can write a node equation that says, and we'll call this current I. So we get current I into the node is the sum of 
I1 plus I2 plus I3 going out of the node of the circuit. And now loop equations are interesting because there are a number of different loops we can take. There are really only three independent loops we can write though. So, um, we can write, we can just take a loop that goes across the battery through R1 and back. So we'll call that loop one. And that's just EMF plus a minus I1 R1 equals zero. And we can solve for I1, right? So I1 is therefore equal to the EMF over R1. We could take a different loop that only goes through resistor two and we'd get EMF plus a minus I2 R2 is zero. So I2 is the EMF over R2. And for three, we get EMF plus a minus I3 R3 equals zero. So I3 is gonna be EMF over R3. And if these are different resistances, you can see that, that, um, that we have three different currents here, but they're related. We can now calculate the total current, the current coming out of the battery just by adding them all up. And in fact, it works out that just um, algebraically here that we can combine these, these two, all these four equations. So if we, we take this equation, the node equation, and we just, but we rewrite, we use this expression for I1, then we're gonna get an EMF over R1 for I1 plus an EMF over R2 for I2 plus an EMF over R3 for I3. And that's the EMF times one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. And so this is only for a parallel circuit. <clears throat> that is not what we got up here. <clears throat> now notice another interesting thing about these, these two circuits. <clears throat> here, the potential difference across each of these resistors <clears throat> is actually equal to the EMF of the battery because you can write a loop equation. So from these loop equations that tells us that. So they all have the same potential difference across them. It's the full EMF of the battery. Here the potential differences are actually um, gonna be different and they're gonna depend on the, the resistance of the, the resistor because if it's higher resistance, we need a bigger electric field. So the potential difference across it is gonna be bigger. So we might get three completely different potential differences across these resistors here. And we will um, we'll practice with this in recitation. A, a final but important point about this kind of circuit analysis is to talk about the power consumed by a circuit. So power, remember, is energy per unit time. So energy per second. Remember that power has units of, so it's joules per second, and that's a watt. <clears throat> so 
so how do we figure out the power uh, consumed when a current power dissipated in a resistor, say? Um, well, we go back to a very fundamental relationship from our study of potential, where we notice that the change of potential energy of a system where a particle moves through a potential difference was just Q delta V, something you used on the test. Um, now, when we have charges moving across resistors, we have charged particles moving through a potential difference because there's a big electric field there. And so, so the, suppose that um, this happens in some time delta T, so we'd have power would be the change in electric potential energy divided by time, which was the amount of charge, we'll call it delta Q, um, that traveled across this potential difference. Um, so we'll write it this way delta Q, the amount of charge, so it's, it's not just one particle, it's like the, the charge of an electron multiplied by the number of electrons that, that traveled to across this resistor in a second. And, but this looks like, this looks like a derivative. So we can write this as dQ dt. And this is actually just the current. So this is actually equal to the current. So the, um, if you think about current, say, flowing onto a plate of a capacitor, how much charge flows on in a second? Well, that's the, the change of the charge of the capacitor per second. And that is actually just equal to the current. So we have power is equal to current times, and this is this is very general. So this is for any circuit element. So it could be a battery, it could be a resistor, it could be a capacitor, it could be inductors or other things that we haven't talked about. So this is this is a general relation that's always. And presumably, the power output of the battery has to equal the power dissipated in all these resistors. Uh, we're not losing energy anywhere. So power in a resistor So we have the current through the resistor times the potential difference across the resistor. But we, if the resistor is ohmic, we know that the potential difference across the resistor is equal to current times resistance. And so, the, the power dissipated in, in a resistor actually is proportional to the square of the current. Um, or we can actually rewrite that a different way. We could write I delta V is equal to, we can write I as delta V over R times delta V. And so we'd get a, delta V quantity squared over R. So there are various um, various things we can do. So suppose we have, as an example, suppose we have 
The current on the circuit is three amperes, three coulombs per second. <clears throat> and the EMF of the battery is 1.5 volts. <clears throat> What's the power output of the battery? So I delta V is going to be three amps times 1.5 volts. So we get 4.5 watts. <clears throat> now, what's the maximum power output? How would we figure out the maximum power output of a battery? Um, well, the maximum power would basically come when we we short circuit a battery. What is a short circuit? A short circuit means that resistance is, is very small. So very small resistance. And so in the experiment, when you, um, you watch the TAs measure the, um, the compass deflections from a long current running through a long straight wire connected to one or two batteries. That was very close to a short circuit because that long straight wire was a thick conducting wire and it had very low resistance. So that was pretty close to a short circuit. Um, you don't want to do that to a battery for very long because the battery gets used up. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> what the power output of the battery might have been in that, that situation here. So for the batteries we're using and the wires we're using, um, so it's an alkaline battery, it's got an EMF of about 1.6 volts. The short circuit current, if you measure it with one of those meters, an ammeter, um, is, is about six amps. So what is the power output of uh, such a battery when it is when it is short circuited? That is indeed why if you put a wrench between the connections of a car battery, it dies because you are short circuiting the battery. Okay, we definitely have a consensus. You all said answer one which is correct. It's 9.6 9 watts, and we, we calculated the power, which was the current times the potential difference. So that was 6 amps, 1.6 volts, 9.6 watts, which is a lot more than the 4.5 watts we found with connected to a light bulb. OK, so you'll be doing some experiments with um, ammeters and voltmeters, or rather participating in some experiments with ammeters and voltmeters. And so I want to talk very briefly about a couple things about voltmeters and ammeters and ohmmeters. So you've seen a voltmeter. Um, and so I'm going to use conventional circuit symbols here just because it makes it easier to draw. So imagine we have a, a circuit here with a power supply and a resistor. And we want to measure the potential difference across the resistor. So here's our, here's our voltmeter. And it's got leads that are marked plus and minus, and it, it's going to show us a number. And the way we connect it is to put these leads. So I'm glad if it seems easy once we've talked about what's really going on in circuits, because the same stuff is going on. This is just kind of a macroscopic view. 
Um, so we put the voltmeter leads, basically we are connecting the voltmeter in parallel. Which would, should mean that we get the same potential difference across the voltmeter as we get across the across the uh, the resistor. But we don't really want to change the current in this circuit. So the voltmeter, in in fact, in a sense, in essence, this is this is another resistor. And uh, so we want we want to disturb this circuit as little as possible. Well, if the if the resistance of this voltmeter was comparable to the resistance of the resistor, we'd have a completely different pattern of current in the circuit. Okay, we'd have just as much current running through the voltmeter as we have running through the resistor. So if this is 10 ohms, and that was 10 ohms, we'd have equal current running through the circuit. That would double the current coming out of the battery. That would, that would change many things. So what we want to do is not disturb this circuit. What we want to do is have very, very, very high resistance here so that the current going through the voltmeter um, is very small and we haven't disturbed the circuit very much. So the resistance of a, a voltmeter is on the order of, of a mega ohm. So that's 10 to the sixth ohms. So that it doesn't disturb the circuit very much. In contrast, an ammeter, we want to measure the current in a circuit. Um, sometimes people just draw a voltmeter, by the way, with just a, a circle and a V. So we could we could draw this as that's a voltmeter connected to the circuit. An ammeter here. We want to measure current, and the way we measure current is we actually want to put the ammeter in series so that the current has to flow through the ammeter. Well, if the, if the ammeter has the same resistance as the resistor, so if this were also 10 ohms, um, we would have doubled the resistance in the circuit and the current would would drop by a factor of two. And so then we wouldn't be measuring the current in the original circuit at all. So we can't do this. What we want the ammeter to have is very low resistance. So we want milli ohms. So 10, 10 to the 10 to the minus third ohms or less so that it doesn't disturb the circuit very much. All right, so next time we will talk um, a bit about capacitors in circuits. Um, and this afternoon in recitation, we're gonna practice just this macroscopic version of, of analyzing circuits and talk about power in circuits. Does the resistance of the ammeter change depending on the situation? Well, hopefully not. Hopefully it's all always low. Now there's one meter, but it can be a voltmeter or an ammeter. And what you're doing is you're turning a dial and the dial changes, you know, completely changes the internal circuit in that thing that you're using. So it goes from being a very high resistance thing when it's a voltmeter to being a very low resistance thing when it's an ammeter but hopefully not. Hopefully the ammeter has really low resistance. It's not zero and you actually can determine it by, by uh, measuring a potential difference over the, am the ammeter leads, but it's low. All right, in chat, what was, what was the key idea here? 
what was the point of today's class? Um, Dr. Shabai? Yeah. I had a question about um, the equations you were writing under uh, power dissipated in a resistor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess I just don't entirely understand. What were you saying when you wrote down those two equations that show like basically like I times delta V can either equal uh, I squared times R or delta V squared over R? It's just two different. I mean, there's less than meets the eye there. It's just um, two different ways of calculating it. If you happen to know the current in a resistor and the resistance you can use that to get the power, but if you happen to know the potential difference across it and the resistance, you can use that to get the power. These are equivalent. So it, it wasn't supposed to be a big deal. <clears throat> okay, then I also have a, according to that, so we said that a short circuit is when R is very, very, very small. So would this be kind of like a, would this be like a, limit equation or something because r is going to be like approaching zero that the short circuit the maximum power output is going to be like approaching infinity or something or um well if um if r really was was zero um <clears throat> then uh then of course the the current would go to infinity um, if you had an actual EMF. Interestingly, in, in superconductors, the property of superconductors is that their resistance is truly, truly zero, as a matter of fact. Um, and what that means is you can't actually have a non-zero electric field in a superconductor. The current just goes forever with zero electric field once you've got it started. And we can talk about how you might start it um, later. Uh, but so so basically the the this is what what this gives us is sort of the effect the the maximum power output of the battery in real world situations, um, and when we talk about the internal resistance of a battery, we'll see why it's not infinite actually, uh, but a short. A short circuit means that you've you've added as little resistance as you possibly could. As Marco said, it's like you know putting a wrench across the terminals of a car battery. Not a good plan. Um, right. And uh, un under those circumstances, what do you get? It what it what it turns out really is that what limits this in the real world is that a real battery is what we call internal resistance, which we didn't talk about yet today. But there's a section in the book, and um, and it's basically just resistance to the movement of ions through the battery. Um, and, and so that puts a practical limit on what current you could get with a short circuit. So um, what, what did, I guess I'm a bit confused on, so what, what did you actually mean by power gets dissipated in a resistor? Because you were saying how those well, equations are like showing. Hot, right? So a resistor gets hot. The light, let's think about the light bulb. The light bulb gets hot, right? And energy is given off in the form of heat and light. So power dissipated in the light bulb means how much energy is given off in the form of heat and light per second. And that better equals the amount of energy put into the, the circuit by the battery. Right, okay, okay. Yeah. And then um, just, sorry, one last question. It's still about that section. It, I'm, I guess I'm just confused because it seems like those two equations you wrote would, as R approaches zero, they come to two different uh, outcomes. Like for the top one there, as R approaches zero, it, the entire thing approaches zero, but as R approaches well, zero on the bottom. Is, okay, so let's not let R approach zero. Okay, let's actually talk about a situation in which R is finite which is what this was intended to be. Um, okay. I guess I was just overthinking it then. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. <clears throat>